Hi, this is Ken for the staff of the Bryant Museum. I want to welcome you to our conversations with players that we've been having. And we're so glad today that Dr. Jalen McCullough has joined us. Dr. McCullough, hello. Ken, how are you? It's good to be with you. Uh, it's so good to see you once again. Uh, and it's really good to see anybody else. We've been in uh, isolation for so long. <laughs> the museum's still closed, even though we've kind of been in and out. But uh, we just haven't been able to see anybody lately. Well, fortunately, we've been working. We've been back since May 1st, and then we're able to perform elective surgery again and see our patients. And so <laughs> it is good to be out and about. And I know you've already been in surgery today. Uh, for folks that might not know, uh, tell them what you're doing, where you are, and what you're doing today. Well, uh, I am a facial plastic surgeon, and I live in Gulf Shores, Alabama. I built an institute here and uh, actually 20 years ago. Lived in Birmingham for 35 years, built a very large medical clinic up there. And in 1990, I sold that clinic to a large uh, national corporation, moved to the beach and thought I was going to retire at age 52. And it lasted about six months of part-time work. And I was miserable and never done anything but work in my life. And so I built another clinic and I'm, I'm at work every day. I love it. I love do, doing what I do, and it's fun to, to uh, make people look better and feel better and feel better about themselves. Well, you got not just a clinic, you got a major complex. You got your own surgical center, spa, just on and on there, don't you? Yes, we do. We have, we have virtually everything that, that uh, one would need, as I said, to look better, feel better, and uh, prolong your life and your, your work years, actually, pro prolong your work span. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit, uh, go back to your high school days. I know uh, you were a high school quarterback, and so why don't you tell us a little bit how you got from quarterback to center? Well, it was an interesting thing. I'd worked really, really hard to win the starting job at quarterback and going into my uh, junior year in high school. And over the summer, our coach was hired away as a principal. So we get a new coach coming in, uh, Coach Morris Higginbotham, who has sent many players to the University of Alabama, as you now know. Um, and so I thought, well, Coach Higginbotham, he'll see the spring game and see what a great performance I had, and he'll change his Notre Dame box offense to the uh, T formation uh, to match my skills. And so we're having our first meeting, and he's walking up and down in front of the, the uh, team, clicking his heels, and he looks around, and finally he, he looks out to the crowd, and he says, where's the big tall kid that used to play quarterback? <laughs> and I just, uh, my heart just sunk. And I said, oh, my God, used to play quarterback. I said, Coach, that would be me. And he said, son, I need to talk to you after the meeting. And so we went into his office, and he said, you know, I don't have a quarterback in my, in my offense. And he said, you can't play tailback. And he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to move you. And you can either play end or you can play center. And uh, I did the numbers. We had three lettermen coming back at end and one coming back at center. And I said, Coach, I want to play. And so he said, all right, he said, I'll move you to center. And then that made me a linebacker. And so I go from being a quarterback on one day to being a center linebacker on the next day. And if you don't think that's not a culture shock, then and <laughs> from standing up behind the center, I'm in a three-point stance snapping the ball back to somebody else. It was a life-altering experience. But, you know, you know, there's always something good that can come out of those things. Had I gone to Alabama as a quarterback, I'd have, com I'd have been competing against Naaman. And so, um, as it was, I think it turned out pretty well for me. Yeah, well, I think I, I, even I can do that math. So, uh, that, that was a good decision. Luck, luck helps sometimes, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So, uh, tell us a little bit uh, about the recruiting process. What coaches were looking at you and how did that happen? Well, I, I was offered scholarships by Florida State, Georgia Tech, Auburn, uh, Clemson and uh, Alabama and I actually had committed to go to Georgia Tech at the time I was dating a girl who had a brother playing on the Georgia Tech team and he was studying architecture and that's really what I wanted to study I grew up in a construction business my dad was a plumber and I worked on construction jobs every year so the only guy I ever saw walk on the job with a white shirt on was the architect. And I said, you know, I was in a ditch six, six feet deep and I looked up and I said, that's the guy I want to be one day. <laughs> so um, I'd committed to go to tech and coach Bryant came along to recruit me and we're sitting around our breakfast table and he reached over on his finger and he pulled off a ring and he passed that ring over to me. 
And he said, but if you ever want to wear one of these that says national champions, you come to Alabama and I guarantee you'll have one before you leave from there. Well, I'd played on a high school championship team. So I'd had a little bit of taste of that championship thing. And so I'm, I changed my mind and I went to Alabama to play for him. And that was the reason that I went to Alabama. Uh, but Alabama didn't have an architectural school. So I went into medicine as a second choice, really knew nothing about it. You know, my dad just used to say, your mom and I want you to have all the education that you, you can get, even if you want to be a doctor. So I go to Alabama and go into pre-med and my life changed, obviously, at that point. It was the, the recruiting thing is a, uh, is a big deal and it's a tough decision. You know, I've written this in some of my books for a 17 or 18 year old kid to have to make a life altering decision with, with being given information from lots of people. It's really a tough decision and it's life altering, you know, not only with my career, but I met my wife. You, many times you're going to meet the person you're going to live out the rest of your life, hopefully with uh, where you go to college. So your decision on where to play college, uh, co college football or college sports is really a, a life altering event. Yeah, that's a great story. And uh, that's another one of those forks in the road that, uh, like you said, a 17 year old making those decisions, you know, a lot of us aren't ready to make that decision. You know, sometimes. A lot of responsibility it really is a lot of responsibility. Yeah. And you know, my parents didn't interfere. They, they sat back and, and let me make that decision. Uh, you know, we've talked to several players uh, on these interviews and through the years, uh, and uh, when we talk about their relationship with Coach Brian, they kind of, well, I don't say it changed from when they were a player to after playing. Did you have that same experience? Oh, my goodness, yeah. You know, I, I think during the time I played for him, I may have had three or four one-on-one -on -one conversations with him. Uh, you know, a couple of them on the telephone and a couple of them in his office, uh, not counting the recruiting thing. And, you know, he wanted me to change positions. He wanted me to consider changing positions. Paul Crane came along and he said, I'd like to have you and Crane in, in a game at the same time. And he said, um, uh, would you consider moving out to what was called the weak tackle position? He said, so we, we, we want to throw the tackle eligible pass. And he said, you got good hands and I think you'd play out there. You, it'd be an ideal situation for you. And so I, I said, coach, I'll do whatever you want me to do. So I went out and started practicing with the ends and tackles for about three days. And I went back to his office. I said, Coach, uh, I want to ask you, would you let me go back to center? He said, yes, son. He said, I just wanted you to give it a, give it a go. So that was one of the few real one-on-one -on -one conversations I ever had with him when I played with him. But um, later on in life, I, I got to know Coach from a totally different situation. I befriended a, a gentleman from um, Jasper, Alabama. His name was Ellis Taylor. Ellis was a devout Alabama fan and, and was a good friend of Coach Bryant's. And he was part of his inner circle. And I came upon Ellis and we got to know each other through some medical situations. And so he saw to it that I was brought into Coach Bryant's inner circle. And so that's how I got to know him from a totally different perspective. And Coach had a lot of problems. He had a lot of health problems, as most people know now. And, and, um, I became his liaison. I was the person that got him appointments with the right specialist and get him in after hours to try to keep all of his health issues out of the press. And that's how we really connected and got to know each other. And then it's no secret, he, he told everybody, but a couple of years before he passed away, he came to me and I did, I did a neck lift on him. And that was the greatest honor of my life is for my coach to come to me and ask me to perform surgery on him. So we hit him in my clinic in Birmingham for a week while he was recovering. And nobody knew he was there but Billy Varney and, uh, and Mayor Hahn. And so uh, he was there by himself all day, uh, most every day. And I'd go by and visit with him in the mornings and the afternoons. And during that period of time, he shared a lot of things with me. And his concerns about the University of Alabama. And he said, he said that the, the day that he uh, decided he was going to retire, he said, uh, Galen, Alabama is going to be in for some bad years. And he said, our people aren't going to understand why. And he said, I'm going to ask you to stay involved and, you know, try to tell them. And he said, it's my fault. He said, I've stayed too long. I should have retired two or three years ago. I hadn't been in good health. I really hadn't been able to coach the way I want to coach. I should have made some changes in staffing positions and other things. 
And he said, we're going to be in for some bad years. And said, the person that, that y'all hire uh, is, is going to have some difficulties. And so he asked me to be on the selection committee and he asked President Thomas to put me on the selection committee. And I also, by the way, was on the uh, co-chairman of the committee that planned the museum that you're sitting in right now. Yes, and he's partially responsible for that too. So he opened a lot of doors for me, Ken, and I, I wouldn't take anything for it. And I look, I, I know I'm, I'm rambling, but I look behind you at the statue of him, the bust of him, and I had a hand in that. Um, the, the sculptor that did uh, that bust was from Provo, Utah, and he called and asked for a couple of us to um, come out and sign off on the bust. I think Doug Jones was a man's name who was director of museums, and yes. Doug and I flew out there together, and the, the sculptor was Blair Buswell, and we walked in, and he had this big clay mass of Coach Bryant, and I looked at it and made some changes and recommendations and and we got ready to leave and he said uh, he hadn't done anything below his shoulders he just had his face and neck and he said aren't you about the same size coach Bryant is and I said yeah he said stand over there so that's actually my jacket my tie and my shirt <laughs> below his head and and so I mean just some wonderful thoughts wonderful memories and things that uh I wouldn't take anything in the world for all those experiences. I've, uh, I uh, worked with Dr. Jones, Doug Jones, and I can remember him telling me about uh, you sitting there with the artist. You are talking about, well, his eyes need to be a little bit like this. And uh, you say, and they all work together about, you know, this is cheekbone, just a little bit here. So yeah. perhaps somebody with your perspective and your skills uh, to talk with the artist was something that he probably doesn't have. It, it, well, it was, it was a great honor for me to be able to participate. And, you know, when, when I got there, he had three or four different photographs of Coach, and they were different ages. And so he was trying to decide where to capture him, at what age to capture him. And I did not want to capture him right at the very end of his life. I, I wanted to kind of move back about eight or ten years and, and, and capture him. And that's really... I think, I think uh, you know, Doug, Doug, uh, he did a good job. Blair did a really good job with it. And fortunately, uh, I was able to participate in that. It's a great honor. And yeah, you see, we have the bus. It's really the first thing people see. We want it to be that first impression is that bus of Coach Bryant. And we well, you could... know, he, do, he doesn't have his hat on. Most every other statue that you see of him, he has his hat on. But we knew that that he, he wouldn't wear a hat indoors. If you remember the first time Alabama played in an indoor arena in one of the domes, he came out with his hat on. Somebody asked him, uh, Coach, what's, where, where's your hat? He said, my mom always told me don't ever wear a hat on the inside. And so we knew that's the way he felt. So we did not want, since he was going to be indoors, we did not want to, to put the hat on him. And when, we're, when I'm talking to a group there, I mentioned that about the hat and I, there's a kid with a, a cap on or something. You can see it come off real quick. <laughs> That's right. Uh, when we talk about that. <laughs> um, I, is there anything, I, I'm, there always is, but what from Coach Bryant did you learn that you passed on to your kids? Boy, I pass on something every day of my life about him, Ken. Uh, I tell people that the entire structure of my clinic and the way that I manage people, the way I hire people, the way I teach, every bit of that's based on what I learned from him. He had such an impact on me that not a day goes by that I don't share some lesson. And I've got a new doctor coming and training with me now. I've, I've trained, this is number 100 facial plastic surgeons that I've trained as a fellowship. And so we were sitting talking just yesterday. And I bet I sat there for 30, 40 minutes and told him lessons that Coach Brunt told us, you know, about how to conduct yourself in the arena, how to conduct yourself after a game, uh, how to conduct yourself before the game. Uh, all of those things were just critical lessons. But there's one lesson that I've written about uh, in, in all of my books that goes with me every day. And it was the lesson that I learned on the very last play that I played for him. And uh, it was in the Orange Bowl. We were playing the University of Texas. It was January the 1st of 1965. We'd already won the championship. In those days, they awarded the national championship before the bowl games. So we went down to play Texas, and 
Coach uh, Namath was hurt. Namath didn't play a hardly any in, in the first half. Texas had a really good team, and we were behind at halftime by 10 points. And so the second half, we, he changed everything. Throughout the game plan, he said, we're going to throw the ball on first and second down, run it on third down. It just changed everything around. So Namath comes in, and we bring it back, and we're five points behind um, toward the end of the game. And we got the ball first and goal on the two-yard line with about two minutes left in the game. No big deal. I mean, we, we just expected to win. Our group was called the Cardiac Kids because we won the majority of our games in the last four or five minutes of the game. So we just expected to win. And, and so three plays later, it's fourth and this much, fourth and goal on the six inch line. So Namath calls the quarterback sneak right behind me and the two lines clash and we get the plays over. I start looking for him and, and uh, he's in the end zone, the ball's in the end zone by a foot and a half at least. So one official comes, takes the ball away from him, raises his hand, calls it a touchdown. Head linesman come run, running in, moving the pile around. He said, did he score? I couldn't tell. And this guy said, yeah, he was in the end zone almost a yard. While they were talking, the guy with the white hat on, it was a, it was a split crew. And he was a Southwest Coast official. So he came and grabbed the ball away from the official that called it a touchdown, put it down on the one-yard line and whistle first down Texas and overrule the touchdown. Well, this was in the days before instant replay. I'm getting to the lesson. And so we walk off the field and, you know, the game was over basically because it was only eight or 10 seconds. I was going to kneel down and it was it. And as we started off the field, somebody behind me on the team, I never will know who it was, said to him, Coach, we scored. And with that, our entire offensive team stopped and we turned and we looked at him. He took a little step back and he said these words. He said, if he'd have walked in, that'd have been no question about it, would it? He threw it right back at us. And here's the lesson. Here's the lesson that I learned on the last play I ever played for. Him. Anything in life, if you want to accomplish anything in life, you cannot do just enough to get the job done. You've got to go above and beyond. And here's the lesson, leave no room for doubt because the world's referees might not make the right decision either. So it has driven me every day of my life to do more than is expected and leave no room for doubt. You know, uh, Tommy Wilcox told us your story, that story that the impression it had on him. So I heard you tell that story and he was well, one of the things he's told people. So it's not just, you know, the, how these stories multiplied, how the importance of that story you just told uh, for everybody to repeat. I did not know that, that I had told Tommy that story. But, <laughs> but, but boy, you're talking about a hard-nosed competitor. He was a really hard-nosed competitor. Great yeah. book. So when we asked him what, you know, one of the things he passed on to his kids, he told that story, your story. It's one of the things that he passed on. Well, I'm really honored. I'm really flattered that Tommy would do that. Makes me feel I really know, good. I, I know you've done so many things for the university and, uh, you got the Bryant Alumni Athlete Award a couple of years ago. I know that had to be a great honor. Uh, the, highest, the highest honor I've ever received, Ken. Yeah, it really is. You know, I receive a lot of honors in my profession and otherwise, but uh, receiving the Paul W. Bryant Alumni Athlete Award was, was the pinnacle of everything. And that inspired you to write a book. It did. It did. I wrote Victory in the Game of Life, and you've been very nice to have me there and do some book signings in the, in the museum. And, and all of the monies uh, for that book are split between the Bryant Museum and the Alumni Association. All the books that I write have never been written for me trying to make money. I, I, I do it as a labor of love. And hopefully it's raised a little bit of money for the museum and, and for the Alumni Association. And I think you're on what, book 15 now? is <laughs> Actually 20. <laughs> 20? Actually, actually, <laughs> yeah, I've, I've got one that'll be going to press within the next two weeks. And it's the, it's called the McCullough Manual for Medical Scholars. And it's all about what young people who think they want to go into the medical field, what they need to do, the, the road to take, courses to take, all of the different things, uh, evaluating schools. And it really is a manual that takes them all the way through pre-med, pre uh, pre -med, uh, through medical school, through residency, and even out into practice. So that, uh, I, I'm constantly writing something. That's my avocation now. I, I don't do, I don't hunt anymore, and I don't fish, and, 
play very little golf. And so writing is my avocation. I'm just always bumping out a book of some sort. And you support several groups on campus. And one of those is a, uh, a program for undergrad just going into not just medicine, but all uh, medical fields, not just physicians, right? Well, it's primarily physicians. It's called the McCullough Institute for Medical Scholars, and it is really for pre-med students, meaning that this one is specifically for um, uh, people that want to be doctors. Now, the program that you're talking about was a one weekend a year event called the McCullough Forum. Now, that's still involved in the Institute, but that's a one weekend event, and those are students who are going into the various fields of medicine, or pharmacy, dentistry, um, medicine, physical therapy, a lot of those things. So, you know, it's that old thing, and I learned it from the man who's, who I can see over your shoulder, and that is when good things happen to you in life, give back. And I think that's, uh, that's really a requirement. It's in the book of Luke, unto whom much is given, much is required. And so I and everybody that played for Coach Bryant had anything to do with it, were given a lot we were really given a tremendous opportunity and I just always felt an obligation to, to try to pass it on and give back. Well, Dr. McCall, we appreciate your time. And uh, I want you to have the last word. I want you to give a little pep talk to people listening out there today. You know, we're in this prior situation, things are so unusual, but uh, leave them with a little uh, words of wisdom, a pep talk about uh, what everybody can do as we move forward. Well, you know, we are in very difficult times, and many of us in this generation have never been through these times before. Uh, the, the, there was our parents and grandparents went through the Great Depression, uh, went through World War II, World War One, been through other things. But this is the greatest challenge, in my opinion, that we've been through in my lifetime. I never thought I'd see a day when we were told that we couldn't go out anywhere, and if we did, we had to wear masks and all the things that we do. And and it's called the abundance of caution. The truth of the matter is, Ken, we really don't know what we're dealing with. And I'm just not quite sure we can trust all the data that's being thrown at us because I believe there's a lot of politics in this, in this pandemic as much as there is in the science. But I think we have to do what, we, what we're asked to do um, to try to protect each other. You know, it's not only protecting ourselves, but we have an obligation not to, if we do have the virus, not to spread it to other people. So. You know, I, I would say just be strong, do what you need to do, look after yourself, look after your family, trust in the medical science, and hopefully we'll get a vaccine, or even I think we're going to learn that the one of the drugs, the hydrochloroquine, is going to be a lot more effective than some people believe it is, and it seems to be having an effect. So we just have to have faith in God and have faith in our ability to do the things that we're supposed to do, and we'll get through this. We will get through this. We've done it before, and as long as we, you know, we follow the American creed, we will, if we stick together. It concerns me that I'm seeing a lot of division. We're all seeing a lot of division in our country in a lot of different ways and, and the upset. And, you know, that's the way to feed our enemies. If, if they can divide us into various groups and organizations, get us fighting against each other, they're winning. They're winning. Our, our adversaries are winning. And, you know, it's, it's that old thing Coach Bryant used to say, first thing you got to do is keep from losing. And if you want to win, keep from losing. Well, we need to keep from losing in this coronavirus thing. And, and the thing to do is to be smart, use good judgment, protect each other and protect yourself. Thanks for those kind words. Thanks for your time today. I know you got patients to attend to. Uh, thank you for the service uh, to the University of Alabama and thanks for being a friend. Ken, thank you very much. It's been an honor to be on with you. And uh, I want to tell you what a great job that you are doing with the museum. I mean, you, really, you really have done a fabulous job there. and it, It's sort of a home. I look forward to coming there every time. I feel very much at home when I'm there. And you make us feel that way. All right. Thank you. And roll tide. Okay. Roll tide, everybody. Be safe.